Welcome to the Hindu News Analysis by Shankar AS Academy. Displayed a list of news articles selected for today's analysis and their page numbers in different editions of the newspaper. The link for the handwritten notes in the PDF format and the timestamping of the discussed articles are provided in the description and also in the comment section for the benefit of the viewers. Now let us move on to the analysis of first news article. This lead editorial is about the recent judgment on NEET examination. The editorial also tries to establish how the examination infringes on the right of minorities to administer educational institutions. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of this editorial article is highlighted here for your reference. We know that National Eligibility Come Entrance Test or the NEET examination is for the admission to MBBS BDS courses and also for admission to other undergraduate medical courses in approved or recognized medical colleges, dental colleges and other colleges or institutes in India with reference to these courses. And the crucial important information here is that the NEET examination is applicable to minority institutions and private institutions as well. And this is where the problem comes and the discussion on NEET assumes importance because of a recent judgment of Supreme Court in April 2020 in the case law called as Christian Medical College Vellur versus Union of India. In this recent judgment, a three-judge bench of the Supreme Court held that there is no violation of rights of unaided or aided minority to administer institutions under Article 191G and Article 30 of Indian Constitution because of the prescription of NEET. But the petitioners in the case argued that NEET is an assault on the autonomy of universities and higher education institutions, particularly private and unaided institutions. And those who oppose NEET argue that in the name of NEET or in the name of state's power to regulate, the rights of unaided private institutions and minority institutions are violated. And according to the author, here the irony is that while the government is talking about deregulation in every other sector, but in the case of education, over-centralization is being practiced. In this context, the author has cited certain important judgments of Supreme Court. One is with reference to the TMA Pi Foundation Judgment of 2002, wherein 11 judge bench held these observations in their judgment. Here point 3 is important as it was held that admission of students to unaided minority educational institutions cannot be regulated by state or concerned university. So what the state or university can do, it can only provide regulation for qualifications and minimum conditions of eligibility in the interest of academic standards for admission. The bench observed that the right to admit students is an essential facet of right to administer educational institutions of their choice. Therefore, the state government or the university may not be entitled to interfere with that right of the institutions. And the bench noted that a minority institution may have its own procedure and method of admission as well as selection of students as long as the procedure that is followed is fair and transparent. Now the second important judgment which was delivered in 1958 in the context of Kerala Education Bill 1957 with reference to minority rights. This judgment made the observation on key words mentioned in Article 30 which is of their own choice. The then Chief Justice held that choice is a dominant word and the content of the article is as wide as the choice of the particular minority can make it. So based on this, in the context of need, the author has noted that if a minority institution wants additional qualifications over and above the need score, then denial of such additional and superior qualifications undermines the choice of that minority institution. The next judgment was delivered in 2003 case law, Islamic Academy of Education and others versus State of Karnataka and others. Here, a five-judge bench held that those institutions that have a special feature and which have been admitting only students of their own community, but if they have a fair and transparent admission procedure for at least last 25 years, then these set of institutions can seek an exemption from a common admission test. And this exemption has to be granted by a committee appointed by the state government and is to be headed by a retired judge of high court. 
and this committee will ensure that the tests are conducted in a fair and transparent manner. And based on all these observations made by the Supreme Court in various case laws, the author notes that the imposition of NEET with mandatory centralized counseling is an unreasonable restriction for an institution that follows an identifiable or reasonable methodology of admitting the students. The author states that while the recent bench of the Supreme Court has considered NEET as the best option as it promotes merit, the author states that there is no real consensus on what merit really means. Because according to some experts, meritocracy requires competition, yes, but also equality of opportunity. But as we know, NEET and even some other similar admission tests do not meet these fundamental criteria because of several reasons. Some of the reasons we can say that we can literally see coaching institutes prospering by providing guidance on these admission tests and such institutions mostly or completely concentrated in cities in urban areas thereby poorer students from rural background and who have studied in vernacular medium have a disadvantage here then there is also large scale variation in the syllabus and standards of different boards be it cbse or icse or state boards so this points to the element of class or the element of you know the opportunity to the privileged section of the society and because of these, the criterion of equality of opportunity gets defeated and it becomes illusionary. In addition to this, the author also buttresses the points with empirical researches as well. The author notes that there are empirical research in USA on standardized common tests, which have found that these standardized common tests are biased against poorer and underprivileged sections of population, such as women and minorities. Several scholars argue that common admission tests cannot measure abilities that are essential for learning, for example, imagination, curiosity, and motivation. These abilities have to be measured because, as we know, there is a lack of commitment of doctors to serve in rural areas, serve in underprivileged areas, serve in difficult terrains, and these measures cannot be known through a common admission test as carried out in the form of NEET. Even though this point was considered in the 2020 judgment, still the bench eventually finally decided in favor of NEET in the name of merit. So the author states that in the recent judgment, judiciary has overlooked these crucial important points. Therefore, the title of this article is NEET is not student friendly and not merit promoting. In the context of analyzing this lead editorial article, we saw about the recent judgment made by Supreme Court with reference to the NEET examination and the argument made by the petitioners and various observations made by the Supreme Court in three case laws which are buttressed by the author to support the arguments. And finally, we saw some points why the present NEET examination is far as far as the criterion of equality of opportunity is concerned. Now let us move on to the analysis of next news article. These news articles are with reference to the third tranche of measures that are announced as part of 20 lakh crore package which is announced under the Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhiyan or the Self-Reliant India Mission. These measures in general aims to strengthen infrastructure logistics, capacity building, governance and administrative reforms for agriculture, fisheries and food processing sectors. The syllabus relevant for the analysis of these news articles has been given here for your reference. It has been announced that a central law will be formulated with focus on three things. One, to produce adequate choices to farmers to sell their produce at remunerative price. Then to ensure a barrier-free interstate trade of farm commodities. Then it also aims to bring a framework for e-trading of agricultural produce. A law focusing on these things is expected to enhance the marketing choices available to the farmers. One another legal measure has been proposed which is to facilitate contract farming. This is to enable farmers to engage with processors, aggregators, large retailers and exporters of food products etc. And this is to enable contract farming in a fair and transparent manner. 
while on the one hand it would assure a minimum remuneration for the farmers on the other hand it also aims to ensure private players to invest in inputs and technology in the agricultural sector Earlier in December 2017 a preliminary draft for the model legislation regarding contract farming was released by the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare the name of the model legislation is the model agricultural produce and livestock contract farming promotion and facilitation act of 2018 and it is reported that only few states have taken inspiration from the model act and has implemented to facilitate contract farming We should note that agriculture comes under state list in 7th schedule of Indian constitution but interstate trade and commerce comes under the union list so the center might use these provisions to frame a law with reference to contract farming or it can invoke article 249 of Indian constitution which deals with the power of parliament to legislate with respect to a matter in the state list in the national interest In addition to these measures the finance minister also proposed amendments to the essential commodities act of 1955 by amending the legislation agriculture foodstuffs you know including cereals edible oils oil seeds pulses onions and potato these shall be deregulated which will be made free of regulation and stock limit will be imposed only under very exceptional circumstances say for example national calamities famine accompanying with surge or increase in prices and no such stock limit shall be made applicable to processes however subject to their installed capacity and these also not to apply to any exporter subject to the export demand there is a certain amount of freedom with reference to stock limit will be given to processes and exporters So these are some of the reforms proposed in the agriculture sector under the legal framework. Now let's come to the financial package. An amount of rupees one lakh crore is to be provided to primary agricultural cooperative societies, farmers, producer organizations, etc., and this will be financed and managed by NABARD. And this amount is to be used for funding agriculture infrastructure projects at farm gate and aggregation points, and in creating post harvest management infrastructure. see farm gate infrastructure will save farmers from distress sale of produce and it also aims to significantly reduce the food wastages then there is also an announcement to formalize about 2 lakh micro food enterprises for this purpose government has announced 10000 crore here the priority or the focus will be on women on units owned by persons belonging to scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes and the units that are in aspirational districts and here the government will go for a cluster based approach here cluster refers to a group of micro food enterprises located within contiguous area in a continuous area which produce same food products or similar food products and in a cluster these micro food enterprises can be linked together by common physical infrastructure facilities so as to help address common challenges faced by them the next announcement is with reference to fisheries wherein an amount of rupees 20000 crore is to be utilized through pradhan mantri matsya sampada yojana see matsya in sanskrit refers to fish which is one of the 10 avatars or incarnations of hindu god vishnu in this appearance it is believed that vishnu saved the world from a great flood so matsya refers to fish here this program aims for development of marine and inland fisheries in a integrated sustainable and inclusive manner and this is to result in additional fish production of 70 lakh tons over 5 years it aims to improve the present employment avenues and also to double the exports here the focus will be on islands himalayan states northeastern region and aspirational districts the next announcement was with reference to national animal disease control program a corpus of more than 13000 crore is to be utilized for this program wherein vaccination of cattle buffalo sheep goat and pig population is to be carried out for foot and mouth disease and also for brucellosis and there is also a plan to set up an animal husbandry infrastructure and an amount of 15000 crores is to be used to set up an animal husbandry infrastructure development fund the fund would support private investment in dairy processing value addition and cattle feed infrastructure the government has also announced financial measures for the promotion of herbal cultivation and also for beekeeping initiatives 
and the operation greens run by ministry of food processing industries is to be extended from tomatoes onion and potatoes top to all fruits and vegetables so these are some of the measures announced as part of third tranche of the self reliant india mission and we expect these reforms would help the nation to realize the dream of doubling farmers income by 2022 despite the pandemic to summarize we saw the proposed legal measures to frame a central law to facilitate contract farming then to amend the essential commodities act then we saw financial packages with reference to primary agricultural cooperative societies farmers producer organizations then formalization of 2 lakh micro food enterprises then about pradhan mantri matsya sampada yojana then also about national animal disease control program and also setting up of animal husbandry infrastructure development fund and promotion of herbal cultivation and beekeeping initiatives this news article mentions that the defense minister of india has approved launch of a special scheme called as defense testing infrastructure scheme with an outlay of rupees 400 crore see the objective of this scheme is to promote indigenous defense production by focusing on participation of msmes and startups so as to bridge the gaps in defense testing infrastructure in our country having such defense testing infrastructure will help in getting access to and also to meet the testing needs of domestic defense production or in other words generally domestic defense industry and testing facility or testing infrastructure is also an important prerequisite for the development of manufacturing base of defense sector and aerospace sector in our country this will help in reducing the reliance and dependence on imports so to achieve comprehensive development of manufacturing base of defense and aerospace sectors government has announced the establishment of defense industrial corridors in uttar pradesh and in tamil nadu so therefore the defense testing infrastructure scheme it removes one of the important obstacles for domestic defense production that is the lack of easily accessible state of the art testing infrastructure and this scheme would run for a period of 5 years and it aims to set up at least 6 to 8 new test facilities it aims at setting up of greenfield defense testing infrastructure as a common facility under private sector but with government assistance and these defense testing infrastructure are to be set up mainly in defense industrial corridors and preference will be given to defense industrial corridors in uttar pradesh and in tamil nadu while we have capability for defense production there is need to set up adequate testing and certification facilities for the defense equipments or systems so for this purpose the scheme will give financial assistance to the private sector so here the financial assistance will be from the central government in the form of grant in aid 75% government funding in the form of grant in aid will be provided 25% of the project cost will be borne by special purpose vehicle which is also known as the implementing agency under the scheme now what is this implementing agency what is this special purpose vehicle who are in it see the constituents or participants in this implementing agency will be the indian private entities and the state governments they will be registered under companies act of 2013 and they will operate and maintain all assets under the scheme in a self sustainable manner and they will also collect user charges so these are the focus areas or these are generally the areas in which the greenfield defense testing infrastructure is to be set up you can find that there is electronic warfare testing software testing ship motion testing environment test facilities ballistic testing facilities etc now let us move on to next news article this news article tells the inspiring story of youth who pursued his dream of performing yakshagana despite being a disabled individual in other words a differently abled individual so in this context let us discuss about this temple art form yakshagana see it's a folk dance drama as a theatrical form it presents mythological and historical stories the center of this temple art form is the coastal area of karnataka and this art form it includes performance wherein we can find music dance and dialogues and this theater form is over 5 centuries old earlier the yakshagana theater was known as bhagavadara athar that mentioned the stories of lord krishna and lord vishnu 
it is also known as bayalattam there is one distinction between the kathakali and yakshagana which is in yakshagana the characters speak so generally this art form it presents mythological and historical stories of ramayana mahabharata and bhagavata purana while performing the performers wear massive headgears and they also use ornaments there is elaborate uh, facial makeup and vibrant costumes such as decorating eyes and eyebrows but know that the costume and the crowns in yakshagana follow the costumes of kathakali it is reported that in the earlier times women were not given the opportunity to participate in this system of tradition and for this reason men were playing women role men at that time used to lengthen their hair and at that time represented women characters but today women participate in this temple art form see it is usually recited in kannada language it is also performed in malayalam as well as in tulu which is a dialect in south karnataka tulu has been in news frequently for finding a place in the eighth schedule of indian constitution now coming to the percussion instruments used in this yakshagana we can find chenda mattalam chengila and ilathalam there are two important varieties of yakshagana the form that is found in the coastal regions is called as paduvalapaya yakshagana and the yakshagana that is performed in the plains is called as moodalapaya yakshagana at one point of time moodalapaya yakshagana was found across 14 districts of karnataka but gradually as the time passed it started fading out because of lack of encouragement and patronage at present it is only performed in some parts like tumkur mandya and in some other rural areas now we should note one fact while moodalapaya yakshagana is included in the national list of intangible cultural heritage it is not yet included in the unesco's representative list of intangible cultural heritage we know that there are two lists under the 2003 convention for the safeguarding of intangible cultural heritage of unesco one is representative list and secondly the list for urgent safeguarding and here the distinction is that moodalapaya yakshagana is included in the national list of intangible cultural heritage of india but it is not yet included in unesco's representative list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity the national list it aims to increase awareness about uh, these cultural elements from different states of india at the national level and also at the international level and also to ensure their protection This news article talks about the renewed interest on alkaloid quinine in a village of the state of Meghalaya. We know that scientists across the world have turned to anti-malarial drugs to see their effectiveness as a possible cure for the pandemic COVID-19. Countries have been testing hydroxychloroquine, a modification of quinine to treat COVID-19. and it is in fact we saw on 11th may 2020 it forms a part under the solidarity trial initiated by world health organization now coming to quinine it is said that it is a potent anti malarial agent malaria did not have a medicine until 1635 ad because at that time quinine an alkaloid which was obtained from the bark of a chinchona tree was found to be effective and as a result quinine rose to popularity and also the places where chinchona tree was cultivated it is reported that chinchona is a native to ecuador which is a country in south america but the commercial cultivation of chinchona was introduced in india by the british in 1800s and this was cultivated in the niligris and darjeeling and some parts of northeastern states but it was found that quinine having some side effects such as irregular heartbeat loss of hearing and lowering of blood platelet count and this has created a need for an alternative to quinine and later synthetic modifications of quinine resulted in the development of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine and therefore quinine became outdated or obsolete and also because of lowering of demand of natural quinine the plantations of chinchona tree also declined This news article states that a village in Meghalaya was named after the quinine extracted from the bark of chinchona. The name of the village is Nongludo also called as Quinine Nongludo. How chinchona plantations came to the state of Meghalaya. See around 1874 AD after Shillong became the British administrative headquarters for the Assam province British found that many parts of Meghalaya were prone to malaria. So to combat malaria and other diseases British introduced chinchona nursery in this region but because of drop in demand and because of ineffectiveness compared to other medications 
the demand of chingona nursery and also the demand of quinine dropped by the mid 1950s therefore the use of quinine was felt to be not much of a success however with the recent pandemic creating panic all over the world while the medical world is yet to find a proper cure for the pandemic this village called as quinine nongledo has created curiosity among the locals of the village so as to assess its effectiveness in treating the disease fortunately or unfortunately if this happens the village locals also eye on commercial gains as well this news article is with reference to the ban on adhan ritual in three districts of uttar pradesh the term is also called as azan as well in this context it is important for us to know about this ritual in arabic this word means to listen See in Islamic tradition a formal announcement is made to Muslims for five scheduled daily prayers so this adhan is about call for prayers among the muslims it is called out from the mosque by muezzin from the mosque's minaret tower in case the mosque is large or from a side door of the mosque if the mosque is small and the person nominated for this announcement is called as muadhan or muezzin it is a position of honor within the mosque and this servant is selected based on good character and with the talent of clear loud voice many reports say that in modern times the muezzin's voice is usually amplified by a loud speaker that is mounted on the minaret see over a period of time this call has become a ritual among muslim fraternity and it also serves as an alert that prayers are about to begin inside the mosque the call that follows adhan is called as the second call which is also called as ikama or ikama summons muslims to line up for the beginning of the prayers and recently this ritual had been stopped by the district administration citing the lockdown rules of ministry of home affairs the matter was brought before the supreme court wherein the apex court observed that the adhan can be recited from the minarets of mosque by human voice without using any amplifying device and such recitation cannot be hindered under the pretext of violation of guidelines issued by the government of india so as to contain the pandemic covid-19 so this is about this news article Now, this news article is with reference to the plight of migrant workers migrant students and migrant laborers amidst lockdown who are stranded in different states without the financial capacity to pay rent without the financial capacity to have decent food a shelter and other basic provisions so to reach their hometowns to reach their native places they take or in fact you know forced by the circumstances to undertake a long journey just by walk even in today's newspaper in the covid-19 special page you can find a news article that states that a 44 year old migrant worker from rajasthan walked 30 km to catch shramik special train as he did not have the money to hire a vehicle the sad thing is that he collapsed on the way and he was declared brought dead before the admission in a nearby hospital such plight undertaken by migrant laborers were brought before the supreme court and the court has stated that it cannot stop the laborers from moving and it is the responsibility of appropriate governments to help to assist these stranded individuals in interstate transport by arranging necessary logistics now this news article is with reference to march 29 order of ministry of home affairs this order stated that all the employers be it in the industry or in the shops and commercial establishments all the employers shall make payments of wages to their workers on the due date without any deduction this is to be followed for the period the establishments are closed during the lockdown but many msme establishments have stated that they cannot be mandated to adhere such a rule when there is no work happening in the establishments and when these entities are sliding into insolvency or loss the matter was brought before the supreme court and the highest court of appeal has asked the central government not to take actions as of now for the failure to adhere to the march 29 order by the private establishments the matter has been scheduled for hearing next week so it's a news in transition and this interim order not to take action on private establishments as of now it comes as a temporary relief for these covid impacted msme sector and other private entities the petitions have also asked the court to order the government to support 70% of wages of their employees through funds from pm cares fund 
So these are some of the matters in today's newspaper with reference to the matters that have come before the Supreme Court benches. This news article is with reference to the press release published yesterday that is 15th May 2020 by India Meteorological Department of Ministry of Earth Sciences on the forecast of onset date of Southwest Monsoon 2020 over Kerala. Usually Southwest Monsoon sets over Kerala on 1st June with a standard deviation of about 7 days. And the onset over Kerala is the indicator of the advancement of southwest monsoon over the Indian mainland. IMD has forecasted that this year the onset of southwest monsoon over Kerala is likely to be slightly delayed as compared to the normal date of onset which is June 1. So the monsoon onset over Kerala this year is likely to be on 5th June with a model error of plus or minus 4 days. While IMD predicts a slightly delayed monsoon onset in Kerala, SkyMet, which is a private forecaster, expects this monsoon to arrive earlier by the date of May 28 itself. So in this context, let us briefly discuss about the onset and some important information with reference to southwest monsoon. See, the duration of this monsoon is between 100 to 120 days from early June to mid-September. The period is called a southwest monsoon period. And around the time of its arrival, the normal rainfall increases suddenly and it continues constantly for several days. And this is known as burst of the monsoon. And generally, by the first week of June, the monsoon arrives the southern tip of Indian Peninsula. Then it proceeds into two branches, the Arabian Sea branch and the Bay of Bengal branch. The Arabian Sea branch reaches Mumbai about 10 days later, approximately around 10th of June, it reaches Mumbai. And this is considered as a fairly rapid advance and it appears over Delhi by the end of June, around June 29, 30 like that. The Bay of Bengal branch also advances rapidly and arrives in Assam in the first week of June itself. And by the first week of July, most of the country experiences the southwest monsoon rainfall. On average, if you see, the South India receives more rainfall than the North India, though the Northeast India receives most precipitation. Now the reason why the SkyMet predicts that there will be early onset of monsoon is because according to its projections the developing low pressure zone in the Bay of Bengal region will help in the early arrival of monsoon in Andaman Nicobar Islands and then also in Kerala. While IMD predicts that because of below normal summer temperatures in North India and because of prevailing rainfall from western disturbances, there will be slight delay in the arrival of monsoon onset over Kerala. Therefore, it thinks it will take more time for conditions to develop enough for the monsoon winds to gain strength and move into Kerala. One of the news articles talk about the efforts taken by the Kerala State Disaster Management Authority as part of preparations for the 2020 southwest monsoon. In the recent years, Kerala is witnessing floods in parts of it and therefore it is updating its monsoon preparedness document by incorporating various guidelines for tackling natural calamity related exigencies amid this COVID-19 pandemic and it also incorporating the lessons learned from the recent floods as well. The prepared document highlights the need to have four different types of relief camps and quarantining facilities side by side in each local body to tackle emergencies related to natural calamities on one side and the pandemic on the other. The 2018 floods in Kerala was known to have brought large-scale deposits of sediments that has resulted in increase in the lake and canal beds. And therefore, a need is felt to clean and desilt so as to increase the absorption capacity and to control the free flow of water during this rainy season. This is the essence given in the article with the keyword Kutanad. Know that Kutanad is called as the rice bowl of Kerala and it lies at the heart of backwaters in Alapula district of Kerala. The speciality is that, according to the government of Kerala, it is perhaps the only place in the world where farming is done up to 2 meters below sea level. So these are some of the important information with reference to the analysis of these news articles. This news article expresses the response of the Chief of Indian Army, the Indian Army General, on the issues made by Nepal with reference to a new road link from Darchula of Uttarakhand to Lipu Lake near China border. 
the general has opined that there was no contradiction at all in the road constructed through Lipule Pass up to the line of actual control, the purpose being to shorten the travel time for the Kailash Mansarovar pilgrimage. While we do know that the road do have strategic implications as well. See, it is an 80 kilometer long road link that originates from Ghatia Bagar and terminates at Lipule Pass, which is the gateway to Kailas Mansarovar pilgrimage or the religious site. We saw about this road, then the concerns expressed by Nepal in this regard, the disputed Kalapani region and the contentious Treaty of Segauli of 1816-80 on our daily news analysis on 11th May 2020. For more light on these issues, we urge the viewers to have a view on this video. We have come to the last session, the practice questions discussion session. This question is with reference to defense testing infrastructure scheme. With reference to recently approved defense testing infrastructure scheme, consider the following statements. Three statements are given. Which among the above statements are incorrect? First statement, it aims to set up greenfield defense testing infrastructure as a common facility under private sector with government assistance. This statement is correct. Since the question asks for incorrect statement, you can eliminate option A and option D. As they say, statement 1 is incorrect. Now come to the second statement. The scheme is limited to setting up defense testing infrastructure in the defense industrial corridors. This statement is incorrect. While defense industrial corridors would be given preference and focus, the scheme is not limited to setting up testing infrastructure in the defense industrial corridors only. Second statement therefore becomes incorrect. Third statement, projects under the scheme will be fully funded by the central government. This statement is incorrect. 75% of the project cost will be supported by the central government, while 25% will be supported by a special purpose vehicle, which is also to be known as implementation agency whose constituent parts are the private entities and the state governments registered under Companies Act 2013. So the third statement is also incorrect. Therefore, the correct answer for this question is option C, 2 and 3. So because second and third statements are incorrect. Now see this question. It is a rich folk dance drama mainly seen in the coastal area of Karnataka. The recitation in this art is done mainly in Kannada but also in Malayalam and Tulu. This temple art form, which is over five centuries old, presents the mythological and historical stories of Ramayana, Mahabharata and Bhagavata Purana. While performing, the performers wear massive headgears, use ornaments, elaborate facial makeup and vibrant costumes. This describe which of the given art forms. The correct answer for this question is option D, Yakshagana. Now let's see next question. Which of the following places was recently seen in news in connection with the alkaloid quinine generating interest in attempting to assess its effectiveness against COVID-19? The correct answer for this question is Nanglado in the state of Meghalaya. Now see this practice mains question under GS2. In the context of recent controversy regarding the national eligibility come entrance test, do you agree with the view that common admission tests infringe on the right of minorities to administer educational institutions? Give reasons in support of your arguments. For this question, you can either agree with the given viewpoint or not. However, you have to give reasons in support for your arguments. The recent controversy is in connection with a recent judgment of Supreme Court in April 2020 in the case law Christian Medical College Vellur vs Union of India. In this verdict, the Supreme Court stated that by the prescription of uniform examination of need for admissions, there is no violation of rights of unaided or aided minority to administer institutions under Article 191 g and Article 30 of Indian Constitution. To support the viewpoint that these tests infringe on the right of minorities, you can highlight Supreme Court judgments in the case laws of TMA Pi Foundation Judgment of 2002, then Kerala Education Bill Judgment delivered in 1958. Then you can also use the judgment in the case law of Islamic Academy of Education and others versus State of Karnataka and others in support of your arguments. In addition to these points, you can also highlight your own viewpoints as well. But ensure that you are able to give in the reasons and arguments within the word limit of 150 words. Now see this question. Discuss and evaluate the measures proposed in the wake of COVID-19 crisis to usher in infrastructure, logistics, capacity building, governance and administrative reforms for agriculture, fisheries and food processing sectors. For this question, you can highlight the various measures proposed under the third tranche of Self-Reliant India Mission where a set of 
legal reforms were proposed and also set of financial measures were announced with respect to legal reforms effort will be made to amend essential commodities act efforts will be made to bring a central law to facilitate contract farming and the state has announced financial measures for primary agricultural cooperative societies farmers producer organizations then about formalization of micro food enterprises then pradhan mantri matsya sampada yojana then funds are allocated for national animal disease control program then animal husbandry infrastructure development fund that is to support private investment in dairy processing dairy value addition and cattle feed infrastructure and also for herbal cultivation and bee keeping initiatives and also extending or expanding the jurisdiction or ambit of operation greens these things you can discuss but certainly you also have to evaluate these measures announced with this we come to the end of today's the hindu news analysis if you like the video if you would have enjoyed the content don't fail to click the like button and share this resource among your friends and those who are in need of such resources and subscribe to the shankarais academy youtube channel to get notified about new updates